Welcome to the Scriptorium. I'm your host, Douglas Bond, and we're having some technical difficulties today, so we're not using Zencaster. We're going to just try it old school uh, uh, YouTube, and I'll share uh, that with you. This is um, uh, the Scriptorium, where we save civilization by reading, by caring about art and music and literature and poetry and all of these things. Uh, today, we're continuing our audio read of uh, The Revolt, my novel, said in Wycliffe's 14th century England. We're in chapter 11, and I'm going to get right to it. Uh, so here we go. Chapter 11, New Wealth. It's lovely, cried Beatrix, wrapping a, a length of green satin cloth over her shoulder and around her slender waist. It suits you, said Willard, enjoying his sister's pleasure. Tis lovely indeed, said their mother. Goes with your lovely eyes, my dear. And there's enough for you, mother, said Willard. The smile of delight that had shone on Beatrix's features suddenly vanished. But wherever did you come by such lovely cloth? It's fit for a princess. Willard, where did you get it? Tell me, brother. But don't tell me you've gone and stolen it. No, don't tell me such a thing. You wouldn't have stolen it, would you have, Willard? Willard put on his best affronted look. Steal. Me? Steal? Lazy fool, steal. I work hard. He held aloft his calloused hands as proof. Besides, I know what happens to thieves, he said the latter, encircling his neck with his fingers, cocking his head to one side and letting his tongue loll from his mouth. This fine cloth is the product of my hard work and my wits, nothing more, nothing less. His mother and sister didn't need to know more than that, but snatching Hubert the friar's silver had troubled him, if only for a moment, he knew how the scoundrel had come by the money, by hawking the Pope's paper forgiveness and fleecing poor peasants. No, it wasn't Hubert's money in the first place. To make perfectly clear to himself, to his conscience, that he had not stolen the money for himself, that it wasn't really stealing at all in his mind, he had made a list of his neighbors and the things that they needed that would make their miserable lives easier. A sheepskin fell for Widow Worthington to keep her warm as winter comes on. New clogs for the potter children. A new hoe for ancient Gregory to keep weeds from his turnips. A bucket that held water for the family of their hard-working neighbor, Randall. A dagger for his cousin, Garth. A flask of good ale for Widow Hannah, whose stomach troubled her. And small beer made it worse. A woolen cloak for his mother, hers now threadbare and of little use against the cold. And he bought the satin cloth. It was an indulgence for any peasant, and there were raised eyebrows of plenty in the market when he made his purchase. But Beatrix and his mother had never had anything so beautiful. He was determined to spend every farthing of Hubert's t takings from the peasants on the peasants. If only he didn't get caught. It would be the noose for certain if he did. He could hope for more mercy from a merchant robbed of his purse than from a friar. The satisfaction he felt being able for the first time in his life to give gifts to others was dampened only by his worry at being discovered. On one of his visits delivering a cartload of stone to Oxford, he overheard news that made him breathe a sigh of relief. Hubert had recovered, though with a, a large gash on the back of his head and a, and a jagged globby place where hair was supposed to grow in his tonsor, but now stubbornly wouldn't. Though the other friars flatly denied it, Hubert had accused them, whilst he was indisposed at the alehouse, of relieving him of his purse. He'd submitted his case to canon law and appealed to the bishop. Relieved, Willard smiled when he heard the news. His last worry was allayed. This good news set him on a course of planning. Uh, might not this be his new calling in life? He was determined to believe that all friars were alike. They roamed the countryside, preaching damnation and bilking the terrified poor out of their meager earnings. It was, it was criminal. If by his wits alone he could set things to rights, so he would. Cover your eyes, then, said Beatrix. It was more than a week later, and they had just finished their evening meal of peas pottage. Are they covered? Willard assured her his eyes were tight shut. In the darkness, he heard a swishing of skirts. What do you think, she cried. I can't think anything if I can't see anything. Open your eyes, silly. You can look now. When Willard saw his sister standing before the open fire in the blue haze that filled their hovel of a cottage, wearing a lovely green satin dress crafted with her own hands to look as close as possible to the fine dress of a merchant's daughter, 
her face aglow and her eyes dancing, he was resolved. No risk was too great. Thanks for listening to the Scriptorium. That's the end of the chapter. It's a short one. Uh, more, uh, hopefully, we'll be back on our regular technology tomorrow. Chapter 12, Slaughter. Go to bondbooks.net and subscribe. You can subscribe to my uh, YouTube channel while you're at it. Uh, there, if you're watching this, you're on my YouTube channel. And share with others. Remember our buy three, get one free uh, there at our bondbooks.net shop. Thanks for listening in. Good day.